Okay, we are in Philippians this morning. You can make your way there. We're going to start with verse chapter 1, verse 3. Um, I think let me start it this way this morning. I'll read for you and then just give you a short introduction and pray with you. Verse 3. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ Jesus, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. If there's one thing you would, if you, if you, were, to, if you were to mention one thing that a relationship cannot do without, what would it be? It's, it's, what is for your hand looking? Uh, it's obvious. I'm not looking for a big, deep, you know, answer. It's obvious. Communication. Communication. You've got to communicate. If you're not communicating with someone, you're not going to build relationships. Okay? Guess what? It is exactly the same with God in your relationship with Him. What do you call communication with God? Prayer. Prayer is as natural to the Christian in his relationship with God as breathing is to you in your human body. If you do not pray, I would say you have to question whether you are in fact a Christian. Whether you're a believer at all. Because prayer is the most natural thing. The moment you enter into a relationship with God, you are praying. Now, The question we want to answer is, how do we pray effectively? What are some of the things we need to do to pray effectively? Because obviously every one of us sometimes struggle with prayer. Have you ever prayed and thought your prayers seem to be hitting the roof? Or sometimes, I I know I sometimes have this where I go and pray and I'm like, what do I say? I've had a tough week, I I don't know. I don't want to unload all of the problems, I just want to speak to the Lord. What do I say? Well, this is what our text is going to help us with. It's going to help us with the question, how to pray effectively. Paul gives three main reasons in this text for his gratitude. You will see that's the main thrust here. Paul as he starts to write the letter, the first thing he does is he tells people, he tells the church, and he's telling us how he constantly thanks God for the church and for everything that they've meant to him. And he gives three reasons for his thanksgiving. The first is he's he's thanking God for their participation in the gospel. Secondly, he thanks God for the hope of their salvation. And then thirdly, he thanks God for his tender affection for them. Well, he's saying, God, I love these people. And because of that tender affection, he's constantly saying thank you to God for them. Now, while we look at each of these in turn, so in other words, I'm going to take you through the verses and look at each of these reasons that Paul gives thanks. My overarching goal, and at at the end with the application, I want to get to this. My overarching goal this morning is to use Paul's example to show you how to pray effectively. And we're going to learn one simple lesson. This morning, the lesson is, to pray effectively, you've got to pray with gratitude. It's a simple lesson. You've probably heard it many times. 
But if you think about your prayers, how often are you thankful? How often are you thankful? Because if you look at Paul, his prayers are inundated. They're, they're dipped in thankfulness. I want to say they, you know, they're seasoned with thankfulness all over. That's a simple lesson. To pray effectively, we pray with gratitude. Father, as we do approach your throne now, together as a congregation, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, whom you have given to each one of us who are born again. And we also thank you, Lord, that we may know you and be in a living relationship with you, that we may pray and speak to you, knowing that you hear us. But this morning I pray that you will help us, Lord, learn this simple lesson, to pray with gratitude, to pray being thankful for what you are doing, for what you have done, for what you will be doing in the future. We pray, Lord, that you will help us make this a life habit as we learn about it this morning and also leave to go home to practice it. We pray for this in your name. Amen. So, I want to go through the verses with you. I want to go look at each one of those reasons of Paul's thanksgiving, reason why he gives thanks for the church. But then I want to draw out some principles from his example to show you and myself how to pray effectively. So, the first reason Paul gives thanks for these people is because of their participation in the gospel. Listen to verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Paul saying, you know, every single time I pray and I remember you, it's not, he's clearly not saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not remembering every single day, but every time I do remember you, guess what I'm doing? I'm thanking God for you. Always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Let me remind you of Paul's background here. He's under house arrest in Rome. He's had a huge ordeal just to get there. He was first of all arrested in Jerusalem. On his last journey, he went to all the Gentile churches to get a monetary gift that he wanted to take to Jerusalem. He gets to Jerusalem, gives the gift to the church, goes to the temple, and as you heard last week, some of these Judaizers, this group that was vehemently fighting against Paul and his gospel, found him in the, uh, in the temple, called the temple guard, arrested him, and then tried to basically stone him, and the Roman cohort came down, saved him from this mob, and then kept him in custody. They eventually sent him to Caesarea, where he spends two years, two years of his life in prison, waiting. <laughs> Nobody's, nobody knows exactly why, you know, what to do with Paul. Nobody knows exactly how to, you know, how to judge his case. He gets to speak to, I believe it was Festus and Felix and these governors, okay? And nobody really knows what to do with him. Eventually they want to let him go, but, you know, he appeals to Caesar. And then that gets him sent to Rome. If you've read Acts, just getting to Rome was a, was a total, like, miracle, <laughs> He gets on this boat, they, you know, they get shipwrecked halfway there, he spends three months on Malta, waiting for another boat, boat to come around, and eventually they arrive in Rome. In Rome, he's under house arrest, that means he's got a guard with him all day, all day long, in a house somewhere that's been rented for him, he's got to pay the house, by the way. You would think, after all of that, that he's got to be pretty, you know, for <laughs> tired, upset, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be a servant of the Lord, life should be easier than this. But there he goes to prayer, and what does he do? He's not inundated with his own problems. And yet, by the way, while he's in, in prison and in Rome, the Judaizers are going around to his churches. They've made a point to go around to his churches. He has reasons to be very worried. And yet, when he comes to prayer, he says, every time I think of you guys, I thank the Lord for you. 
Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. I want to take you to a couple of letters because I want you to see this is not an isolated case. This was Paul's habit, giving thanks to God for these churches and these people that he knew. Romans chapter 1. In every one of these letters, this is the way he writes and he speaks about his prayer life for them. Romans chapter 1 verse 8. First of all, he says to you Romans, by the way, this letter was written roughly at the same time as um, the letter to the Philippians. First of all, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Now, he has never met this church. He didn't know these people, but he heard about them. And what does he do? Praise the Lord. Thank you, God, for, for the testimony of this church. For God, whom I serve in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of His Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if perhaps now at last by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. Notice those words. Always in my prayers. In verse 9 he says, God is my witness how unceasingly I make mention of you. I'm praying for you as often as I can. And I don't stop. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 4. As a side note, the only letter of Paul in which he doesn't do this is Galatians. I just, it's a testimony to how, how I think... Um, how serious the situation in Galatia was and how desperate he was to speak to this church to save them from a false gospel. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, I thank my God sometimes concerning you for the grace of God. No. You've all got the word always there, Right? Every single time he remembers these people, he starts by saying, God, thank you for the grace that you have given them. Thank you for the grace that you have given them. That in everything, he says, you were enriched in Christ. In all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you lack in no, in, in no gift awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in Ephesians chapter 1, in Ephesians chapter 1, these are the churches that he carries on his heart. These are the people that he is praying for and he's constantly in prayer. And every single time he's in prayer and he thinks of the Galatian church, or he's, excuse me, he's thinking of the, the church in Corinth, he's thinking of the church in Rome, he's thinking of the church in Ephesus, He's overflowing with gratitude to God. And I want you to remember his situation. He could have been inundated with complaints. God, you you know, why is life so difficult? God, you know, please deal with these Judaizers. Rather than getting bogged down with the problems, what does he do? He starts with thankfulness. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15. For this reason, now he's just given them all the the blessings that God has richly blessed them in Christ Jesus with. And he says, for this reason, because of all of these blessings that you've been given, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints. So I heard about it. What do I do? I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. And then you can turn to Colossians. I'm not to, excuse me, you're not going to turn there. I just want to tell you if, you, if you're taking notes, look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 3 to 8, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 2 and 3. Both do the same thing, where Paul, whenever he thinks of these churches, the first thing he does is to give thanks. 
Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. I'd like you to turn there with me. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, says Paul, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Don't forget that. We are commanded to be thankful. So Paul is saying, in, don't, be, don't worry about things. Take it to the Lord, but do it with thanksgiving. In other words, season your, your prayers with thanksgiving. Again in Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, excuse me, it's Colossians chapter 3 verse 15, and then we turn over to 4. These are commands for us to be thankful. While we see Paul's example, Philippians, he says, Pray with thankfulness. Colossians 3.15 Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. In other words, that's let the peace of Christ rule amongst you and be thankful. A command. Again, Colossians 4 verse 2 Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it, with an attitude of thankfulness or thanksgiving. Thessalonians chapter 5. Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. With uh, verse 18. Let me start in 17. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. In everything... Give thanks in everything. In other words, when the clouds are over and it's really dark, give thanks, Paul says. That's his situation. And that's the example he's giving us. Give thanks. Just like a generic antibiotic, gratitude is a strong antidote that combats a wide variety of sinful attitudes that we all are tempted with. Sometimes Things like bitterness, depression, anger, discontentment, malice, rebellion, self-pity, greed, selfishness, immorality. Thankfulness is an antidote against these attitudes. In Romans chapter 1 verse 21, Paul says, It is because people did not recognize God as God and give thanks that God gave them over to their sinful desires. Interesting that God says, you are unthankful and therefore I give you over. We think of Israel in the desert when they were going through the Sinai desert on the way to the promised land I think the thing that the Lord disciplined them the most for was unthankfulness. God provides for them the manna. He makes sure that their shoes and their clothes don't wear out. And still these people go, Yo, we're so sick of the manna. You know, it's every day it's the same thing. Lord, when can we have some of the leeks and the and the and the and the and the 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 fruit and the things we had in Egypt? And then God judges them because of unthankfulness. Thankfulness is important to the Lord. Thankfulness is like an antibiotic against the sinful tendencies that we all have. So, what is Paul so thankful for? If we turn back to Philippians, the first thing he says he's thankful for as he thinks about these people is their participation in the gospel. He says... I'm always thanking my God every time I remember you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. So every time he prays and thinks about this church, he thanks God for their fellowship in the gospel. 
you remember that I've used the illustration of a yoke. If you have an ox cart, you yoke the oxen together. And they are in fellowship when they pull in the same direction. That's what Paul's saying. You guys are yoked with me in this work of the gospel. How are they yoked with him? Well, they've been trying to support him from the first day. Every single time they think of Paul, they think, how can we help him? How can we support his ministry? And Paul sees that as fellowship in the gospel. You remember that this church was one of the very few who continually sent Paul material help on his missionary journeys. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that they even begged him to allow them to partake in that gift he was preparing for the Jewish church in Jerusalem. And Paul was probably saying, guys, I know you don't have much. I don't want to burden you. And they go, we don't care. We want to help. Please allow us. They were always desperately trying to support the work of the gospel wherever they could. And they had real fellowship with Paul in the work. That's what Paul looks at. He looks at that and he sees God's work in their lives and he overflows with gratitude for God's work that he sees. Not only this, he also gratefully prays because of their salvation. Read with me verse 6 there. Verse 6 he says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, Paul, as he looks and thinks about these people, he looks at them and he thinks about them, he notices God's work in their lives. Their fellowship is not because they are good people. Their fellowship in the gospel is because of the new birth that God has wrought in them. And he thinks of God and he says, Thank you, Lord. Then he thinks of, you know, if that's true, that they are born again, I know that God will see them through. I'm sure this is going through Paul's mind. He's thinking of these Judaizers. He's, he's worried. Of course he's worried. Like you would be over your own children. He's worried that what's going to happen to this church? They're a young group of people. What's going to happen when these Judaizers get there? And they start to infiltrate the church with that false gospel. They win people's trust. What's going to happen to, to these young Christians? He could have been given over to worry, but what does he do? But I know the God who saved them. And I trust him. I'm convinced that God will keep them. And gratitude wells up in his heart. We might often be tempted to jealousy when we see God's goodness in the lives of other people. Paul could have been as he's sitting in that rented house under house arrest with all the things that just happened to him. He's not able to get to his churches that he loves. He's not able to do the work that he loves. And then he looks at the other Christians and, you know, many of them didn't have the kinds of problems he had. He could have been jealous. Lord, you know, why do you do that? I, 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 I do all of this work for you and then look at me. I, I can't get to these churches. I, you know, I'm, I'm under house arrest. I, you know, he could have just, like a little horse with those little things, you know, what do you call them? Blinkers. blinkers. There we go. Right? Well, those little blinkers. The problems is all he sees. We might be tempted to anger and resentment because while we in dear hardships, other children of God are being blessed. We might be tempted to pity ourselves because God seems to forget about us. In cases like this, your prayers will be crowded with wants and needs and complaints. But Paul's prayers weren't. Why? The answer is, he was looking for reasons to be grateful to God. 
This man was looking for reasons to be grateful. Sometimes, instead of listening to yourself, you've got to speak to yourself. Okay? You've got to push back on all of these temptations. And how do you do that? Let me make a point of looking for things. In these people that I'm tempted to envy, look for things that I can be thankful. Be grateful that God is being good to those people. Be thankful for that. Isn't that, you know, if you've got kids, that's the one thing you try and teach them. You know, because uh, uh, when, 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 you're, when the brother or the sister gets something that they can't have, they go, you know, oh, that's unfair, that's unfair. It's the first thing we do. And then you've got to teach him, why don't you, can't you be grateful for them? Can't you be thankful that he has an opportunity or she has an opportunity to play with that thing? That's that's what the Lord's got to teach us. We don't always have the same gifts and the same opportunities, same blessings, but we can be grateful for the blessings that God gives other Christians, just as Paul does. I can see Paul sitting in that room, you know, at a little table with a makeshift chair because they didn't have much and the guard is probably standing at the, at the window smoking his pipe. And Paul, you know, it's winter, he's not able to really clothe himself properly, but thank the Lord he's just get, been, received this gift from Epaphras, which is, they probably gave him some pieces of clothing, maybe a blanket because he didn't have that, and some money. And he's going, oh, praise the Lord. You know, I've got so much to be thankful for. Life's hard, but how blessed are they? Thirdly, Paul also gives thanks because of his affection for them. In verse 7 and 8 he says, It's only right for me to feel this way about you all. He says, It's right for me to, 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 to know that you will be saved in the end because I see God's work in your life. It is right for me to to be thankful and grateful for God's work and your participation in the gospel. Because I have you in my heart. I love you guys. I have affection for you. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. What he's saying there is, there was a time when I could preach the gospel freely and you were participants with me. Now I'm imprisoned. I don't mean much, but still you keep supporting me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Their continual support meant the world to Paul. They've been supporting him during the times he was out spreading the gospel, and they have now been supporting him during the time when he's been confined and unable to do that work. In all of these situations, this little band of believers had been a source of unending support and encouragement to Paul, and they've quite literally carved their faces, their imprint on his heart. And you sense Paul's joy here. You see his appreciation as he calls God as his witness. So, Paul's prayers are not burdened with complaints and hampered with silence and dragged down with some self-pity because he's thankful. He's thankful. We hear him constantly uttering his appreciation and his gratitude. So, what's the pattern here? And let's see if we can draw out some guidelines for ourselves to help us Pray effectively like Paul does. The first thing I want to draw out of here, and it's not in the text, but let me explain how I get there. If you take into consideration everything that Paul's gone through, you take into consideration everything that he can be worried about, the Judaizers, you know, subverting the gospel and, um, you know, and his churches, if you think about that, what keeps him being thankful? is his settled trust in God. That's the foundation. If you don't have a settled trust in God, you will struggle to be thankful. You will struggle to be grateful. A settled trust in God is absolutely fundamental for you to be grateful. You've got to know that God is in control of your life. 
I like to think of the will of God as, a, as an iron curtain and only what He wants to, He allows into my life. Nothing else can come in unless He says, yes, that is what I want for my child right now. This is Paul with the settled trust in his heart that God is in complete control. Those Judaizers can do what they want. God will save his children. And another thing I was thinking about is this keeps him from thinking that he's so central and pivotal to the whole work of, God, of the gospel that you know the churches will die without him. No, Paul, if you, are, if you die today, God will keep them. He knows that. And he can rest. There's a wonderful picture in Psalm 131. Let me turn there. You don't have to turn there with me. I'm just going to read to you a couple of verses. But this picture is what I'm thinking about when I think about Paul's settled trust in God and the kind of trust we have. He says, O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. There's a beautiful picture of rest. I'm not controlled by all of these things that I need and want and worried about. I can rest in the lap of God, if you will. Because I trust Him. You know, a little baby that's not weaned yet is clamoring for milk. They don't want to stop, you know. They, they, they're always busy. This child that's weaned, we've come to the end of that. We can rest. How do you cultivate a settled trust in God? How do you keep hold of it when you are tempted? Speak truth to yourself. Don't listen to yourself. Speak to yourself. There's a difference. When you listen to yourself, you're going to go, oh, these problems. <laughs> and they're going to make you worry. And you're going to, there will never be an end to that. In the midst of those troubles, you know, instead of listening to them, what is the truth that God has promised to be and to do for you in the midst of those trials? Speak that truth to yourself. That will cultivate a trust and a rest. The second thing that will help us pray effectively with thankfulness is look for reasons to be thankful. Paul literally looked for reasons to be thankful. Now I want to apply this to, you've got your family around you, you've got your own life, you've got people that you work with, you've got people in the church, you've got things in the country. Okay, In every single situation, I'm saying, look for reasons to be thankful. Our default setting is to look for the things that trouble us. Okay, It's always like that. We are all tempted far more to see the things that are wrong and then hop on about that. My children are not what they think they should be. My husband is not what I want him to be. My wife is not what I My life is not what I want it to be. The country is not. You know, the list can go on and on and on. We can all find problems in things around us and people around us. But Paul has made it a habit of saying, what can I be thankful for? What can I be thankful for in my children, in my husband, in my wife, in my life, in my country, in my church? What can I be thankful for? Look for God's work in other people's lives. And I, and I list them for yourself. Look for evidence of God's grace in people's lives. I'm thinking of common grace, as well as grace that, that brings about salvation. Look for God's provisions in other people's lives, and then list them as reasons for thankfulness. So we've got... Cultivate a settled trust in God. Secondly, we see that Paul looked for reasons, and that would be the second thing, is look for reasons to be thankful. And then the third one is very simply, register them in your prayers. 
Paul registers these reasons every time he thinks of and prays for these people. So in other words, he's going to prayer. The first thing he does is he gives thanks. He spends time in thankfulness. Every time you pray, start by saying thankful for the things you have listed. Whether you've made a physical list or just a list in your mind, right? Start with thankfulness. You will be surprised how that changes your attitude. Quite often, you might get to the end of that thankfulness and you've forgotten your problems. But I don't know, Lord, I, don't, I wanted to moan about something, but I've just, I'm so grateful for all of these things. Life's actually not as dark as what I thought. Make a habit, not a rule, but a healthy habit out of expressing your gratitude to God. Now, I know this was a simple lesson. But Christian, this is the beginning of effective prayer. Sometimes you go to prayer and you're you're burdened with a lot of things. In those moments, start with thankfulness. List them for yourselves. Trust the Lord. Entrust your problems to Him. Paul says, and, and, and Peter says, don't be anxious, but in by prayer and supplication, let these things be known to God with thankfulness. With thankfulness. Always season your prayers with gratitude. That's the first place to make your prayers effective. Thankfulness not only helps you to guard over your own attitude, but it gives your prayers a pleasant aroma to God. Father, it is a simple lesson that we learn from Paul. We know that we are commanded to give thanks in everything. But Lord, we know that we are so easily tempted and drawn away by all of our concerns and problems and things that we struggle with, things that we want to change or things that we wish were you know, different. We pray that you will help us, each one of us in this week, to put into practice this simple lesson, to be thankful. Help us, Lord, to remember the church, to remember the individuals in this church. Help us to think of the people we work with, the country we live in, the family we are in, and help us, Lord, to see the things that we can be grateful for and then to be thankful to you for them. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless us in our prayers, that we will be a praying people filled with the same joy that Paul had, filled with the same trust that we see in him, and filled with gratitude in all things. And for this we pray in your name. Amen.